hello and welcome everyone to this Learning Zone session on why does climate risk matter to pension schemes. My name is Kate Bolden and I'm a Senior Policy Advisor in the DC team at the PLSA. Today I'm pleased to be joined by three contributors. Pat Sharman, who is Managing Director at CCK. Kisses are a custody bank and are data specialists in providing sustainable governance reporting for schemes on cost, trans cost transparency, ESG and climate risk. I'm also joined by Chandra Gopanathan, who is Senior Investment Manager in the Sustainable Ownership Team at RailPen and is responsible for the Climate Risk and Opportunities Workstream. I'm also joined by Professor Ralph Toomey, who is co-director at the Graham Institute, which looks at climate change and the environment at Imperial College London. In this session, we'll be discussing the climate risk. <coughs> so we'll be discussing the climate risks that pension schemes are facing and how trustees can understand and take action to address the climate exposures in their underlying investments. You can tweet about the session using hashtag PLSA Annual21. And here, if you have any questions for the speakers, please do put them in the chat box. And if we have time, we'll get to them in the end. So I'll now hand over to Pat to kick us off. So thank you, Kate, um, and good morning, everybody. So the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was published in August, and will form the basis of negotiations at the COP26, highlighted that scientists now believe that human activities are the key cause to climate change. In 2019, carbon dioxide concentration levels were the highest for 2 million years. In August this year, Spain recorded its highest temperature at 47.2 and Sicily recorded 48.8. This chart, which is in the report, is a really good illustration as to where different countries are at different stages of achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, net zero by 2050, and limiting global warming to 1.5. Those that do, will be well positioned to achieve climate resilient futures. However, if we carry on as we are today, we will become climate unsustainable. So the report also highlights the need for more corporate responsibility. Companies will be encouraged to increase efforts to become carbon neutral and also to launch their own green initiatives. <clears throat> In our recent survey that we undertook with the Pensions Age this summer, 65% of pension schemes recognised that managing climate risk is a key factor for them. So the UK pensions market, we're the third largest in the world with approximately 2.5 trillion of assets under management. We invest in a lot of companies and we're therefore in a very unique position to drive change. And we can help do this through active dialogue with our asset managers and through measuring and monitoring the, the carbon emissions in our assets held in both pooled and segregated portfolios. So I'm now going to hand over to Chandra so he can actually give his view on what he thinks the risks are to pension schemes. Over to you, Chandra. Thank you very much, Pat. And thanks to PLSA and Cassis for the opportunity. Um, as Pat highlighted on, the, on her previous slide, there is clearly growing uh, urgency on climate change and it, uh, the threat of it becoming a critical systemic risk. Now, uh, the IPCC and IEA reports have talked about uh, global warming uh, with no action potentially leading to a temperature rise of three degrees plus by 2100. And these are actually um, substantiated by a lot of scientific evidence in terms of um, the last decade being the hottest in the last 125,000 years or even longer, uh, that most of the climate change being attributed to is human-made and is the specific cause of uh, weather events that we've been experiencing recently. And there is also a narrowing range of warming responses to GHG emissions, which means the certainty around climate risk being a systemic risk is actually growing. So 
with with all of that in mind, uh, what does this mean for the financial system, and what does this mean for pension funds and trustees? Uh, if we can have the next slide, please. So, in terms of in terms of uh, climate risks, they affect global corporates and sovereigns, uh, especially uh, in high emission sectors and high emissions countries. So, you're talking about oil exporting countries. You're talking about countries which are um, which use coal fired power generation, countries which are generally laggards in energy policy. And the same holds for a lot of global corporates within those countries and multinationals as well. So for pension funds and for investors and trustees, this directly affects holdings in equities and debt in these corporates and sovereigns. Uh, the global financial system, which includes mainly banking and insurance, is linked to these high emission sectors and countries mainly through the business of lending and insuring both credit and equity risks in these sectors and these jurisdictions. You have shares, you have bonds, you have project finance, asset finance, all of which are instruments, financial instruments, which fund uh, the, the high emission sectors and countries and uh, contribute to systemic risks for asset owners. So just to put some numbers onto it, carbon tracker estimates show that this amounts to about 18 trillion in global equities, including corporate sovereigns and the financial system. It's about 8 trillion in global bonds and about 30 trillion in unlisted debt, which is which are quite staggering numbers. And all of these link to high emitting sovereigns, sectors, companies, and the banks and insurers that fund and insure them. <clears throat> so if that's not proof enough, uh, as far as the numbers above are true, this is it, it's highlighting that climate change is in fact a material financial risk. And by that token is also core to fiduciary duty and needs to be accounted for in investment decision-making by trustees and investment managers. And I will pass it on to Pat uh, again for to emphasize the importance of taking action and how. Thank you, Sean. That gives us a sense as to how you're looking at, at climate risk. So thank you for that. So this is where it becomes interesting. So despite the fact um, that pension schemes understand and are focusing on managing climate risks, as I mentioned on my earlier slide, the perception of the impact of climate risk is misaligned. So in our survey this year, um, we asked the same question that we did of our survey last year. What impact do you think climate change will have on your scheme investments? And the, the results are, are very similar. And in fact, 70% of pension schemes are actually saying that they only believe that climate risks have a low or medium impact on their investments. I'm going to hand over to Ralph in a moment um, to, to actually discuss the different types of risks in, in more detail. But at a very, very high level, you could have a company that's reliant on crop yields or a company that's based in an area that's um, exposed or prone to flooding. And these companies will have to make large capital investments to protect and manage their operations. And bring this a little bit more to life, to some more numbers. And according to State Street, 60% of the S&P 500 and 40% of the S&P 1200 Global are exposed to physical climate risks. So I'm now gonna hand over to Ralph, who's gonna bring a more scientific view to this educational session. Over to you, Ralph. Thank you. So the risks that uh, conventionally people talk about, uh, we had already mentioned, is sort of split into physical risk and the transition risk. I'll start off with the transition risk. So the transition risk is about the energy transition, which will happen. And the risk is to do with how will your companies and your portfolio deal with that uh, transition. But I think it's worth one, maybe breaking it down the risk into maybe, I think, maybe four relevant components, just to make, to make that a bit clear what we mean by, by transitional risk. So the first thing is the risk due to change in policy. So that, that would essentially be that you have a company that is just at the wrong end of the policy or that has to implement policy in a way that is costing. And the policy trajectory we're in the month of, uh, of, of COP coming up. The trajectory of policy is clear. There will be more regulation. So the cost of business will go up. And the concern with uh, policy is particularly that policy could change quickly. And people call this disorderly transition. 
So if there is a sudden political shift and a policy shift, uh, companies are not prepared and then they are uh, eff effectively flat-footed. And then you could end up with, uh, for example, stranded assets if you're a fossil fuel company, if you're not, if you're assuming everything's gonna go slow and steady and suddenly things happen quickly. So policy is a, is a, is a, is a risk and th that policy goes a lot quicker than any of you think. And it has been, I think, if you think about if you told me 10 years ago it would be illegal to have uh, petrol cars in the UK by 2030, I would have thought that in, um, seems implausible. Right? So things can happen a lot quicker than you realize. So that's the policy risk. Reputational impacts. So um, this is to do with whether or not shareholders want to be associated with companies and whether there is uh, increasing uh, pressure to disinvest from certain activities so and is the company itself meeting sustainability goals is it in the crossfire so there's the reputational risk and that can also go very quickly and rapidly and disorderly so that is a risk um, there are general market preferences which of course is the market cycle so that that sort of go, comes and goes but there are definitely preferences. So at the moment, there's a strong preference for anything labeled or approximately labeled as ESG, whatever that means. So they are, f what you call preferences, let's call it preferences, not fads, but let's call it preferences. And uh, certainly pensions like to be in the long term, but who knows how the short, how long the short term is. So if you're in the wrong part of the preference cycle, uh, there is there is a definite risk there. Finally, um, also extremely important uh, is technological disruption. So universities like Imperial College, all of the universities are working hell for leather on innovation. And if inevitably, and there is huge amount of government funding, philanthropic funding. So innovation is happening at all levels and technological disruption can be fully expected. So if you're relying on technology, which is fossil fuel intensive, and you think that's going to be working for the next 10 or 20 years, there's a lot of people that want to eat your lunch. There's going to be a lot of technological um, and driven by government funding and big money funding causing technological disruption. So if you are stuck with old technologies, there is a risk that you will just simply be um, outsold. So you end up with a situation, for example, where solar and wind is now financially competitive with gas. Again, something that you would have thought unimaginable 10 years ago, pure technological innovation. So those are the, the, the transition risks. What that means then in the market means that there, there could be things like a carbon price, which you need to factor into equities. Um, there's a premium you might want to attach to certain companies, carbon premium. However, all of those prices and premiums will be uh, regionally specific. So in some countries, uh, they will apply a different price to others. So it becomes very segmented, very problematic and very dynamic. So it's a, a moving feast. So I think that sort of paints the picture, I think, for the, for the transition risk. So the physical risk, um, next slide. So this is quite a busy slide, but that's the only one I'm going to talk to. So I think, I think to some extent, this slide in my mind captures a lot of the essence of climate change. So the title of this is, is about extreme events, and I focus on extreme events because they're actually the ones that, that, that are the most uh, problematic for companies and, and the, the funds you, you, um, you hold. And the essence of the message is that the uncommon becomes common. So, so how, how, do, how do we get there? So what I'm showing you here is a, a, a probability distribution. So the y-axis is just the probability of a certain temperature happening. And the x-axis is the actual temperature, and you can see the label cold, average, and hot. And so you've got basically, let's assume a normal Gaussian bell curve, so a standard probability distribution. So you have an average, which is bang in the middle. That's what happens most of the time. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's hot. Now, when we do this probability distribution, we actually take out the seasonal cycle. So actually, it can be a cold July or it could be a cold January. I'm sort of taking that off. So I'm saying it's two degrees colder than it should be in July, or it can be two degrees colder than it should be in, on the 1st of January. That still goes into the cold tail there on the left. So my average is just what I expect in the, in the, in the season. And the extremes on either side are sort of what we call the anomalies. 
and see what you see from the distribution. Then generally you sort of have this um, bell-shaped distribution. And the key point about uh, climate change is that this distribution then shifts. And the way we perceive the shift is, is, is two ways. First of all, we're sort of stuck in this uh, middle bit there with the arrow and the top bit, and I call this the adapted zone. So this is your average temperature. So this is what we're used to. So we're used to having fluctuations around the average of a, of a couple of degrees. And this is why for a long time, people thought, well, what difference is one degree, three degree warming matter, right? So on a day-to-day -day basis, one or two degree differences on a day-to-day -day basis don't make any difference to us. We're fully adapted. Everything we design, build, our clothes, our way of living is fully adapted. We know it's January, we prepare for January. We know it's July, we prefer for July. And if we shift the January temperatures just a little bit, or, or July temperatures just a little bit, doesn't really doesn't matter. And that's why I call the adaptive zone. So that's what we experience most of the time. And we really, therefore, not really bothered about the weather. We don't really care, which is where the complacency comes from. Now, if you look at the tail, though, if you go to the right side, you know, the hot as an example, what happens then is what we perceived as hot. So the dashed line would be the hot. So in the past, we sort of would have picked up those things. So this, this would be even from our own memory, was that all oh, those are really hot days. And just by shifting the distribution, suddenly those hot days become a lot more common, maybe three, four times more common. So that's sort of in the regime where we sort of pick up things, we notice things and think, oh, well, that's, that's happening a lot more frequently. It's, it's sort of just at the edge of the adapted zone, so it's not really causing us headaches. But it's, it's something we pick up and all of us have you know, starting to know because where's the where's the snow? Where's you know? Where's the glacier? Where's all these things? So that's the first bit, and then to the far right is where the real problems are, and this is what I call the unseen. So in that, if you look in that tail there, you're sort of looking into the margins, into the shadow. You can't even begin to see what's going on there, and that's partly because we haven't gotten any data. So these are very few events. They're extremely hot. Then what happened like in Canada, we suddenly end up with six, seven degrees above normal and they are unseen. So we have no experience about them. We know statistically that they happen. And the problem is if we shift the distribution as we know we are, these unseen things suddenly become seen. So suddenly you see them. And we are dealing then in a space there where we have very little data, we have very little experience, we have models, climate models that just can't deal with it very well. And yet the probabilities have exploded. If you look at the y-axis there, it's sort of invisible probability, hardly ever likely to happen and suddenly becomes measurable. And that's the problem. It's out of our range of experience and that's where the complacency comes from. And that's what people think, oh, it'll be fine until it isn't. Because we're basically rolling the dice and we're dealing, into, we're moving into this unseen area, we're moving out of the adapted zone. And that is the key aspect of uh, physical risk. So you can draw these plots for rainfall, for droughts, for temperature. Here's just temperature. Any weather variable you want, you can draw these distributions. You can argue about the shapes, how much it shifts, and all the rest of it. But the essence of the argument is always the same. We're, we're sort of we're worried about the tails of these distributions, and we're playing with them, and we're shifting into, into these unseen uh, events. So I think that completes my presentation. So I'll hand over back to Pat. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. Really interesting and actually, um, you know, really different way of talking about physical risks um, to what we usually do is use examples to bring it to life. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. So we just heard everybody from two experts as to why it's important for pension schemes to take action. Um, and, you know, when I come to this slide, why do we feel an independent view is important? Well, really, um, it's, it's quite simple. I think from good governance, I think from the ability as a pension scheme to understand the actual risks and to then, to then manage them. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, a lot of pension schemes are still very reliant on their asset manager or, or their consultant and helping them um, verify and, and manage their climate risks. And only 11% at this point in time are actually independently verifying the climate risks, um, majority being the larger schemes. So why is that? So in our survey, um, one of the results that isn't on the slide, is that 42% of pension schemes feel that one of the biggest challenge 
challenges is, is good quality data on both ESG and climate risks. So not a surprise there. Um, and that's probably why so few schemes are actually undertaking um, independent verification. However, we, we know the data isn't perfect and Ralph made that very clear. <laughs> Even the scientists haven't got the perfect um, data, but it is getting better. And there is data available, um, especially I think with pressure from governments and policymakers and, and the great work of the likes of Ralph are doing um, on, on both companies and investors to, to both you know, report um, climate risks and, and monitor them. So we really believe that independent reporting is critical for pension schemes to enable them to, to manage these risks um, and meet their regulatory obligations um, going forward. So I'm just going to hand over to Chandra now to, to let him talk about how Railpen are, are managing some of these risks. Over to you, Chandra. Thank you so much, Matt, and thanks, Ralph, for the for the detail uh, around the physical and tra transition risk stuff. That was really enlightening. So now that we have a better picture around climate risks and its potential implications, uh, let's see what what all the fuss is about around net zero and why there is so much push to to focus on net zero. And uh, we'll talk about our thoughts overall, and then get into what Ralpin has done in there uh, in our net zero roadmap uh, going forward. So net zero effectively refers to the balance between GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, which are produced and which are removed from the atmosphere. So netting out to zero at some point in the future. Now it has been legislated by the UK to have net zero by 2050 and at a certain intermediate level, I believe around 78% by 2035. But what does that mean for asset owners and investors? What that means for us in our simple minds is Let's understand the emissions footprint of our investment portfolios as asset owners. What, again, what that means in even more simple terms is let's understand our exposure to high emissions sectors, high emissions geographies, and put it in context of our strategic asset allocation. How much do we have in public equities? How much do we have in bonds? How much are we exposed to, uh, to uh, energy, utilities, aviation, transport, those sectors, and for investment managers and trustees and asset owners to get a handle around what their, how their portfolios are structured from an emission standpoint. The second bit is understand how this emissions trajectory is going to evolve over time. So the higher you have, uh, you are exposed to some of these sectors, there is a possibility that you, your trajectory is potentially going to be significantly higher or will be increasing over time instead of decreasing as well. So let's try and understand that. And the third bit is let's try and figure out how to reduce it over time. So we have more details around around that bit in the next slide, but those are really the three building blocks, understanding the emissions footprint, understanding the forward trajectory, and figure out how to reduce it over time. So with Railpen's net zero plan, we've tried to break it down exactly with those, uh, in those simple terms saying, we start with a set of baseline emissions, which is covering it for not our entire portfolio, but majority of our portfolio, which is public equities and, and fixed income. Then looking at interim targets, which are 2025 and 2030 targets at uh, you know, 25 to 30% lower targets from baseline and 2030 targets, which is about 50% lower than baseline. And then focusing on the, the long-term, which is the net zero emissions by 2050. In all of this, our focus is on real world decarbonization versus just on portfolio. We'll touch on that a little bit more uh, on the next slide as well. The idea is we don't just want to be selling from our portfolios to, 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 to others who will own the same thing. That's not really, in our view, making a difference to the economy as a whole. Instead, we would like, we would like to engage and align ourselves to a reducing carbon footprint over time with our, with our portfolio. So uh, with a lot of funds asking, okay, what, what happens if they don't commit to net zero? We don't have the resources, we don't have the, the size, we don't have, and there are so many complexities. The one thing I would say, I agree with all those challenges that exist today, and we as an institution have faced it and continue to face it as well. And we, we're facing up to it, uh, I'd say, on a daily basis and, and tackling those. I would say for funds and asset owners, it is really a lost opportunity if you don't jump uh, and start tackling climate change today. Because the, for the first time in history of investment funds and of uh, policymakers and governments and regulators, they're all aligned to one single goal of reducing emissions, which hasn't happened before in my limited experience in the past anyway. There is a huge pool of resources in terms of climate research, frameworks, methodologies, 
as Raf mentioned, you know, a lot of scientific research going on in terms of technologies, both to decarbonize and both in terms of a growing pool of investment opportunities as well, in terms of what you can buy and what you can invest in in renewables, energy efficient technologies, solutions. And there are collaborating organizations out there which are doing a lot of good work. Grantham included, TPI, IIGCC, all of these are institutions which do offer asset owners a lot of resources in terms of frameworks, methodologies, data, sources, templates, all of these sorts of things, which, uh, which asset owners can take advantage of. So if we move on to the next slide on, um, we go over, okay, how do we walk the talk? It's easier, it's all well and good and easy to talk about this and how do we sort of look, how do we see ourselves executing and implementing this? I'd say one thing that this is a journey, both for ourselves and for the ecosystem as a whole. And like I said, like Pat mentioned before, the UK Pension Fund uh, universe has a lot of parties, including asset managers, consultants, uh, you know, asset owners, small and large, and then the portfolio companies themselves. So there are a few things that would play into this, uh, which help the decarbonization process. One is the market decarbonization itself, which we're seeing companies starting to get to decarbonize and change their operations in ways that, you know, that align to Paris, uh, align to net zero. There are possibilities for exclusions. And we see a lot of a lot of firms doing that as well in terms of excluding coal and tar sands and starting to look at, you know, shutting down coal fired plants, particularly with their portfolio companies, uh, looking at benchmark adjustments as and when needed. So if there are passive portfolios that are there, looking at if there's tilting needed or if there's other climate transition type benchmarks that are available. And engagements, which we think are the key to decarbonizing, is working with your companies, particularly the largest emitters within, you, within the sectors who are looking to transition to a net zero environment. So working with them in terms of assessing their climate transition plans and using the voting uh, your voting policies as a mechanism to go in and engage. And last but not least, to look at climate solutions as well, which is you know, investing in all of these wonderful technologies that are coming up uh, and you know, while balancing your fiduciary obligations to, to examine those as a growing pool of, of assets as well. So uh, th those are sort of in a nutshell, those are the different things that, that, uh, that uh, we, we highlight and we implement internally as well in our, in our uh, journey going forward. There is a concern that you know, the pension funds may not have the resources, they need additional expertise, et cetera, et cetera. Let's all be honest, that is true and additional resources don't hurt, but the philosophy at our end, and uh, we, we would advocate that across, is that let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Data is improving, engagements are the yielding results, and at a very basic level, let's use the resources we have and move our net zero commitments to understanding our own portfolios better and being able to collaborate with industry organizations and with our external managers to, to translate those things uh, to, to enforce, no, I wouldn't say enforce is probably too harsh a word, but to go in and, and sort of align those things and make sure that they report in ways that uh, they, they help us understand. There are uh, side agreements that are possible with IMAs, with asset managers as well, in terms of engagement, ESG reporting, stewardship reporting, all of those things, which, which uh, pension funds can potentially, uh, potentially get on and start uh, implementing in their own portfolios. So we have a small, we have an article with the PLSA for uh, which sort of advises smaller schemes to, on how they can uh, can uh, go forward with this as well, which we'd be happy to discuss and forward if if that's if that's helpful. So with that, I'll hand it over to Pat to uh, for her perspectives on the 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 overall asset owner universe and and how this can be implemented across as well. Thank you. So thank you, Sean. Just some really impressive work um, by you and your team, without a doubt, at Railpen. And as you alluded to, you know, um, I, I suspect there's a few trustees that might be on this session thinking, well, that's great, Chandra, but I really don't have access to, to that resource. Um, and how can I implement a framework like that? And, you know, as you alluded to, you know, we, ha we have to recognise that. But I am a trustee of a small DC trust based scheme. And it's very small um, in comparison to Railpen. Um, and we have actually implemented our own framework. And... Where did we start? So first of all, I think it's really important um, that we just develop our understanding. And that's what we did um, as, as a board of trustees. We really sat there and looked at each other and said, well, what can we do? So we got some training and we started to understand, um, you know, climate risk. So that's what we did at the beginning. That also helped us develop our, our SIP, 
which we kept very simple because we we're a small scheme. So we knew there was only so much we could do. And then what we did is we screened all our assets, which are held in pooled funds. So I want to state this, they're held in pooled funds. So a lot of people say, well, how can you do that? But we used an ESG and carbon reporting tool that allowed us to do that. And they gave us look through, like I said, into the underlying companies. So for example, we had the carbon footprint of the companies that that pooled fund was invested in. All of the companies, not all of them, around 60 to 70% of them. So it gave us good insight. And this was rather than just going with an overall rating on a portfolio, you know, really understanding what were the individual risks within, within the pooled funds. So this then allowed us to have a robust discussion with our asset manager. We actually had a better understanding after that discussion around engagement, how they were engaging with companies, how they were encouraging companies to decarbonize, and also how they were monitoring and analyzing those risks on an ongoing basis. So I completely recognize as a trustee of a small scheme that it's not perfect. And even the DWP has stated in the new TCFD regulations um, that it is as far as we are able. However, we feel as trustees of a very small scheme that we're undertaking our fiduciary duty as far as we are able, but also doing our bit to drive change, which we think, again, pension funds are in a unique position to do so. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to finish at that point, and I think we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Pat and Chandra and Ralph. Uh, that was really a lot of information. It was really good. Um, so we do have quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. At the very start, um, Duncan James put in a quote from James uh, Coney of the Times, um, and I'll paraphrase uh, the quote, really, but it's basically saying that ESG uh, is kind of a ruse, it's nothing but marketing, I think was the phrase. Um, so for skeptics, of it, it's basically kind of skeptic of ESG labeling and measuring products by those metrics. Um, and Raf, you kind of touched on this a bit in your one with ESG product uh, and maybe it being a fad, it would be good to get your views on that and whether you kind of agree with that quote um, or, or have a different opinion. I personally, I completely agree with it. I think I think it is a marketing wheeze. I think people are exploiting it. I think that's a way of charging extra fees. I mean, there's lots and lots of things wrong with it. That's nothing got that's got nothing to do with the transition risk, and nothing to do with the physical risk. So these are games people are playing, and they're welcome to play them. And I don't think that matters one way or another. But the the issue is, you know, the issue doesn't go away by 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 various forms of labeling and and seeking refuge in them. So I, I, you know, I'm obviously not in that, but I, I notice, for example, that you can, you can create all, all sorts of different funds with all sorts of different flavors, and there's questionable issues in there. So, you know, there's, there seems to be a whole cottage industry around labeling of the ESGs. But just because it's really not done very well, doesn't really mean the issue isn't real, and and, and therefore you can just dismiss it. I think you just need to separate about what's going on in terms of what people are trying to sell you and what really needs to be done. I think maybe there are two different things. I think, Ralph, can I just touch on that? Because you are right. And I think what's really important here is that independent look through, which is why, why we make that point, is we think pension fund trustees should take that independent view, um, you know, screen their assets with independent data to that of their asset manager to actually undertake their own view on what they think potentially the risks are. And we know that's not perfect, but it's not perfect anywhere. Even at your level, it's not perfect. So I think from our perspective, that's where we're coming from. And you're right, funds are being labelled as ESG and there's the term greenwashing. So that's why we think, just like I say, that independent view, screening your assets um, for carbon emissions, carbon footprint um, and other things really should, should be um, undertaken by pension pension schemes. Yeah, I agree. You, you Thanks, need to look Pat. at your own risk. Thanks. So, Chandra, I don't know if you had the question through the fire alarm and if you wanted to. I didn't, apologies, but if you wouldn't mind repeating it or we can go to the first question that was asked, which is pending, so. Yeah, sure, we get to the first question then about uh, kind of engagement with 
I can yes. the big account. Yes. So the question the question is about specifics of engagement itself, or. Um, so when you have a big company, like a big of your company, how much can engagement, how far can engagement actually change their behavior and kind of make a difference in what they're doing? Sure. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely pertinent question. And I think that's one of the areas that still remains unexplored, in my view, in terms of engagement impact and what sort of impact does a company, does, a, does an investor actually have? Clearly, the larger the shareholding, the the, the more the collaboration between lead investors, I think the, the, the better the outcomes are. And what we're seeing, I mean, historically, as we've seen with the outcomes with Shell and, and Exxon and, and a few others, there has been movement, but it's been, it's, it's taken a while. And what we typically tend to, tend to look at is collaborative engagements as well. You have parties like Climate Action 100 plus and a few others that you can collaborate with. And while you do that, one of the things that we have developed internally is a transition assessment or a transition plan assessment framework as well. So looking at the various pillars of where the company is actually going uh, is, is lacking in terms of its either walking the talk or in terms, in terms of its talk itself as to how far or how far ahead or behind it is, uh, whether it might be climate accounting issues, whether it might be data issues, whether it's to do with plain governance, all of those sorts of things. So these issues can be raised in a substantive way during the working mechanism. So, so long answer, uh, look, sorry, short answer to the to the question is that it is it's taking long. It used to take longer. The timeframes are reducing for engagement impact, and I think the more the ecosystem gets involved, particularly asset managers, consultants, everybody gets involved with the large uh, large emitters. I think the faster it it, it makes the process, but uh, and everybody everybody gets to do their bit to move, move this forward, so. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to combine a question from Jim Anderson and Tim Lee um, around reporting. So Jim's put, in order to control something, you need to be able to accurately measure it. Um, and at the moment, there's not a universally accepted means of measuring various, uh, various carbon footprints of companies. Um, and then kind of Tim's put, what, you feel uh, are the targets sufficient for ESG reporting kind of around there so it'd be good to get your view on whether you think kind of the data's out there what universal metric should maybe be um, and then whether you feel at the moment the ESG reporting on companies is sufficient and um, so if we maybe go to Chandra again sorry Chandra and then sure the rest of the sure I mean there's there's a number of issues and uh, very pertinent ones that the, that the question raises uh Number one, is the data available good? Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not. Is it good? And is it improving? Yes. I think on the scope one and two emission side, there is reasonable data available today than there was two years ago. And I think that's positive. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, standardized metrics, yes, there is still a lot of work and a lot of debate around what metrics are core and what metrics are, are nice to have. So. There have been discussions around temperature warming and how relevant that actually is to uh, in a portfolio construct. Uh, and there is discussion around the simple metrics like weighted average carbon intensity for the portfolio. So while these things, and I think TCFD does a pretty good job in terms of being able to you know, identify, uh, being able to you know, require reporting on that front so people understand it, investors and trustees understand it better. But I would say, I think we, we go back to the same simple principle saying, the first thing to understand is how much of high emission sector exposure that you have. And I think the IIGCC net zero investment framework does a good job in terms of highlighting how you go about it, where you identify the 70% or 70 or 80% of your material emissions in your portfolio, identify where it's coming from, identify whether you have the right numbers. I mean, make sure you have scope one and two emissions numbers at least to start with. And, and start there. So that I think that gives you a, a reasonable idea of the tail risk in your portfolio as it relates to emissions. And then you go from there. So I, I, I re-emphasize the, the rule from our end is that we don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So it, it, things are good, they're not perfect, but they are improving and we want to be part of the journey, so. And can I just, can I just add to that, Chandra? So absolutely agree with everything you've said. I think also consistent data from one year to the next, so looking for trends and what we've seen as a pension scheme is a significant increase in coverage from one year to the next um, and also consistent across asset managers. So using that consistent data, I uh, use that consistent reporting. So at least I've got a comparison, but you're right. It's not perfect and we've still got a long way to go, but 
I think we need to make a start. It's too important. These risks are too important to, to not take, make a start just because it's not perfect. Great, thank you both. I, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, as well. I feel like we keep talking for a lot longer on these and apologies if we haven't got, gotten to your questions, um, but you can connect with the speakers and, and follow up with them. Um, so you can connect with Pat, you can uh, send a connection request through the profile uh, and follow up and ask your questions directly. And the slides will also be available in the documentation of the page uh, once we've finished here. Uh, we would also really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill in the session feedback uh, on the, the conference platform. And um, if you enjoyed the session, you may also be interested in attending a session later today on UK pensions and climate of six. So lastly, in the last couple of seconds, I just want to say a big thank you again to our speakers um, and thank you to the audience for joining us today.